Good afternoon, Western Civ I students. Last lecture, I talked to you about Anglo-Saxon art, the art of the sort of wild Northwest European barbarians in the 500s and 600s AD. Well, you'll remember that one of the things that happens in the 600s AD is the establishment of Islam. Uh, Muhammad, who died in the year 632 AD, uh, had composed the Quran and an Islamic law called, code called, called the Sharia law. And in both the Quran and the Sharia, he maintained what is called iconoclasm. Iconoclasm, technically, what it originally means is the smashing of images, not allowing images of human beings at least, but Often all animals are forbidden in strict iconoclasm. Now, the Ten Commandments has the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image, thou shalt not bow down unto them and worship them. The second commandment in the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus in the Christian and Jewish Bible. Um, and traditional Judaism took that pretty literally. They would not generally uh, depict in art in ancient times, Jews, would not depict human beings in art, or uh, even animals often were, were thought to be too tempting. Remember the golden calf? Um, too tempting toward idolatry. So many Jews in the ancient world were strict iconoclasts. They would not allow a human or an animal image to be created because they thought it might violate the second commandment. There have been times in the history of Christianity where people have gone that far in Christianity. Um, and in the Reformation, some aspects of Reformed Christianity, uh, again, thought the second commandment forbade any kind of religious art. So you might go into some churches and you might see a bare cross on the wall or maybe nothing at all. Um, other Christian churches will have statues and stained glass windows and all kinds of art, but that's a di difference among Christians as to how to understand the second commandment about graven images. And that, that would be an interesting discussion for another class. The iconoclasm does play an important role in the history of, of Christianity, and we'll get to that later. But um, Muhammad took the older, much more rigid view. He did not want any kind of representational art of anything that could be worshipped. And the earliest Muslims forbade any kind of figurative imagery. But fairly early on, you do have the de development of an elaborate calligraphy in Islamic art. Look at this beautiful piece of calligraphy here. These are quotations in Arabic from the Quran. Arabic has a very flowing script that it's written in, and it really lent itself to this magnificent calligraphy. Uh, and this is the most ancient and in some ways most classic Islamic art, is beautiful calligraphic inscriptions from the Quran. The, the Kaaba in Mecca, that great stone, basalt stone cube of a temple in the center of the great mosque in Mecca that is the central focal point of physical worship for Muslims around the world where they turn to when they pray, is actually covered in a giant black silk cloth that has gold embroidery in the form of a calligraphy like this all over the sides of it. So it is the most revered form of Islamic art, calligraphy of the Quran, Quranic sayings. Um, but you'll notice that they don't just have the calligraphy, they have these stylized, repetitive, almost mathematical kind of details around it. Uh, and this would become the sort of core of Islamic art. Um, now, Islamic art, fairly quickly made its peace with vegetation. <laughs> not animals, certainly not humans. But pretty early on, the caliph said, it's okay to paint 
flowers and trees, and especially vines. All this curving calligraphy sort of lent itself to depictions of vegetation like vines growing wild. They appear to be kind of crazy, kind of like the calligraphy. But when you look deeply, they have subtle, magnificent, repetitive patterns in them. So if you're talking about Islamic art, one thing you want to look at, let's go this way, is how often you have very regular forms repeated again and again and again, showing the regularity of God's creation, but then very detailed. Now, what this is, this is from a mosque built in the 700s in Spain. Remember, the Muslims overran Spain in the late 600s and early 700s. And they built this beautiful mosque in the south of Spain in Granada. It's the Alhambra. And so this is a, a doorway, part of a detail of a doorway in the Alhambra from the 700s AD. But look at the unbelievably delicate carving, the very regular kind of form of everything. But then these very interlaced, I guess one of the sort of like pine cones maybe, but are not, they're, they're probably not snowflakes, but they have that almost mathematical geometrical regularity but at the same time, incredibly intricate in intertwining the, the regularity of God's creation, but also the interrelatedness of everything in the universe under God's sovereign law is, is a theme these Islamic artists want to strike. And you'll see it in, well, here's a, a carpet from Persia, an Islamic carpet from Persia. And again, you could divide this. It is bilaterally symmetrical. Uh, the whole thing is almost flawlessly symmetrical. Um, again, you might could discern, I'm not certain you can discern even flowers in it. I guess those are flowers, but they're very abstract, very stylized flowers. So again, this is barely figurative, if it's figurative at all. Absolutely gorgeous. I'm sure you'd agree. It's magnificent to think of the artistry of the carpet weavers who wove this thing on hand looms. Just unbelievable. Uh, but the beautiful colors, the regularity, this is, again, right at the very core of Islamic art. Whoop. <laughs> um, moving over there. Okay. A um, little, little architecture for you, Islamic architecture. This, again, is a mosque. Very often in Islamic architecture, you see this pointed arch. See that pointed arch? And domes, small domes. This actually reflects the, uh, the influence of East Roman or Byzantine art in early Islam. When Islam came out of Arabia, it slammed into Palestine and Syria and took them over. Uh, it, uh, it picked up a lot of Eastern Roman design and then modified it. But again, this, this mosque, perfectly symmetrical, perfectly symmetrical, mathematical regularity of everything. So when you're looking at Islamic art, just keep this regularity. It's meant to make a theological statement about the God who created the universe. Uh, you know, the, the details are often exquisitely fine. But, uh, you know, the artistry is often absolutely amazing. Uh, but this, again, classic mosque design. Here's a bowl. Now, maybe that's a kind of animal head. So as time goes on, you begin to get a little hint of animals appearing here and there. But they're very abstract. I mean, maybe that's a kind of animal, I guess. A horse, perhaps. I don't know. Um, but it's so abstract, so stylized that look at that magnificent thing, that, that dish. Uh, just again, you saw this, I think now you'd start to say, I'll bet that's Islamic art. Now here we see a much later, this is I think from the 1400s in Persia, it's a porcelain dish. Uh, and now you see these, these peacocks have made their appearance. The flowers look more like identifiable flowers. As time goes on, you do have creeping in animals and easily identifiable plants into Islamic art. Uh, the first thousand years, iconoclasm pretty much kept people from messing around like this, but slowly they begin to creep in uh, the further you get from Arabia. <laughs> I believe this was made in Persia, but it might even have been made in like Uzbekistan, even beyond Persia. But here is a mosque I know that is in Uzbekistan. Look at the beautiful tile work. Those are mosaics. 
magnificent tile. It's this blue tile, the Islamic world, very famous for these blue tiles, magnificent blue tiles, minaret here. But look at the intricacy. Again, very little you could identify in any way, but all this, see that calligraphy up there at the top? Very fine calligraphy all over the place. So stylized, you know, I don't read Arabic, but I would wonder how hard a native Arabic reader would have to strain to make out what was in it. The pattern's the point, not the words so much. I sometimes you think of this later stuff. Uh, again, here's a nice glass vase, beautifully blown, but very much the intricate, interrelated, semi-vegetation patterns. Just marvelous. Here is a brass with enamel inlay. Uh, these are, again, Quranic verses inlaid. This very elaborate calligraphy. See more Arabic calligraphy up here. I'm sure, that's the Quran, too. Now, this is a casket from Syria in the 900s. And, yeah, it's got Quranic verses up here. It's definitely Muslim. No question about that. But look at those animals on it. Look at the animals everywhere. Look at the people. You're not supposed to have people in Islamic art. This is from the 800s in Syria. But remember, they had only taken over this region from Christians 200 years earlier. And this is very much the kind of ivory object they had been making for churches and for rich Christian people before. And these traditions were so deep-seated, these traditions that stretch back into Christianity and then the Greco-Roman world before Christianity of the kind of art they made there, they just couldn't keep people from doing it. <laughs> uh, they slipped it in, and you put a Quranic verse on it, so it's Muslim, but somehow the rich got away with having these kind of things, although they do break Sharia law. Oh, another beautiful mosque. Again, the perfect symmetry, the pointed arch, the beautiful mosaic inlay. Just marvelous. Here you can see more clear vegetation, pointed arch, perfectly symmetrical again. Beautiful dish, not perfectly symmetrical. It does have a kind of a top on it. But again, the, the, you, if you saw this, you would definitely assume it came out of a Muslim culture, I think. Again, Nice detail on the side of a building. Look at the beautiful mosaic inlay. Here's the calligraphy you'd expect again, Quranic verses. Now, I wanted to finish this discussion of Islamic art with the Alhambra. It's in southern Spain. It's in the city of Granada. It was built in the 700s AD, and it was part of this Muslim conquest of Spain from the Visigoths, the Christian Visigoths. And they built this great mosque there. And it is, in some ways, the most exquisite of all Islamic architecture and art. Look at the magnificent detail, the sea of columns, which appear to be lighter by the way they've got these pointed arches, but with miniature little arch arches among them. The way by cutting into the plinth above it, it looks almost like it's weightless, almost like a little bit of lace or something instead of stone. Just gorgeous. Uh, a lot of Islamic uh, architecture, sorry, go back. A lot of Islamic architecture has these open pools. Remember, this is a people that came out of the desert and they were obsessed with clean, flesh, fresh running water. Uh, and so although this thing is a beautifully balanced, symmetrical composition, it's got water at the heart. Very often they do. More detail, look at that in the Alhambra. Here's a little... Folly, a little fun little room. That's what you call an architectural folly. It's a little fun, fun place uh, just for kicks to hang out and maybe, you know, rest your feet, splash your feet around in the pool of water or something. Uh, look at that pool, beautiful blue tiles again in it. The trace work, almost like lace. It's made out of stone, but the whole thing looks light as a feather because of that almost lace-like tracery. Here is a dome, the great dome inside. Look at the incredible detail. But again, nothing figurative at all. Maybe things a bit like vines, but that's the most you get. This is still early Islamic art where they were being sticklers for nothing figurative. Nothing figurative. So there's a quick tour through Islamic art for you so you can understand what it was that Muhammad's iconoclasm and yet the magnificent creativity of Islamic artists created. Thank you.